I want to welcome you to uh, endeavoring with me through a journey of uh, customized ablations. Uh, we have several options today and I want to keep this interactive. I can show you some data, I can describe to you some techniques. I also have a treatment computer here with me so we can design and treat one or two patients together. So we'll put the patient data on, we'll have uh, one of our surgeons here, uh, if you like, uh, to volunteer and come in and, and design what is it that we can do with topography guided treatments. And I have uh, a big array of cases that we can look into and potentially treat. Um, and I will give you a little teaser on what cases we have available for you. The sample cases that I have here are uh, just naive virgin myopic eyes. So how to do a simple myopic eye with a customized ablation, topography guided contour. How many of you practice in the U.S.? So we have half of your U.S. practitioners. Uh, so contour in the U.S., uh, virgin hyperopic eyes, this would not apply for U.S. Uh, colleagues because uh, topography guided has not been approved for hyperopic corrections here. I can um, show you some um, keratoconus suspects treated, treated topography guided, irregular corneas, uh, post scars from herpetic disease, uh, from uh, displaced astigmatic keratotomies, um, eyes that have undergone RK in the past, how we can treat them topography guided to normalize the cornea, enhancements. And then uh, several keratoconic patients. I do have the Wavelight platform with Alcon, and I also have the Schwind platform uh, for those of you who practice outside the U.S. and have access to a Schwind uh, laser. So my name is John Kenalopoulos. I, um, I practice full-time in Europe, in Athens, Greece, and I also uh, am in New York almost every month and a half. Uh, I'm. Uh, uh, on clinical staff at NYU Medical School and in practice on uh, Park and 61st. But the majority of what you're going to see here is performed in Europe where we did have C-Mark, so the equivalent of FDA approval for topography guided treatment since 2003. So it's been a while uh, since these treatments uh, have been out there and thus the uh, title of the two decades for topography guided. So let's pull the room. Uh, we have uh, an hour and a half. How much lecture, how much case designing? I'll give you three options. All lecture, option one. Option two, we'll do an hour lecture and half hour designing. Option three, we'll do half hour lecture, one hour designing. Option four, we call it a day, we go have lunch. <laughs> All right, okay, so we'll, we'll see how it goes and please raise your hand. This is, for those of you who are not familiar with topography guided, wafer guided treatments, this stuff is very complicated. Let's start by uh, my financial disclosures. I do consult for most of the companies um, of the products that I will be discussing, but not in a capacity of a current study or consultation fees, um, mainly as a consultant of what to, they can uh, develop and evolve. So let's look here at uh, topography guided. Topography guided was designed in Europe initially to be able to treat, to fix sick eyes. So let's look, let's look at an example. This happens to be my first case back in 2003. And I presented a series of these cases at the American Academy in 2004. So we established I'm kind of older than most of you in the room. Um, and what we're trying to do, who wants to guess what we're trying to do here? This is a 2020 high myo patient. Why do we want to treat him? Absolutely great, because this patient had significant problems with uh, glare at night. So this is one of the problems with the old technology lasers. Those of you who are familiar with the broad beam lasers, I'd work with a summit laser back in 94 in Europe, and in my training in Boston, I got certified on that laser in, uh, it was 96, if I'm not mistaken. And the effective optical is almost four and a half millimeters. So, 2020 patient, problems at night, 
We have a new tool to fix it. So what do we do? We ask the topographer to enlarge this optical zone to this optical zone. Did it do it? Yeah. Does it look center and larger? Anybody wants to take a guess? How is that patient post-op? Is he happy? Should be happy. He has a better optical zone. I agree with you. He wasn't. Why? Because pre-op, he's 20-20, pre-op for me. And now with the larger optical zone, he's minus one and a half. So his uncorrected vision dropped from 2020 to 2040. So he's miserable. Why? And this is the first lesson taught here is that when you do topography guided, the topography looks only at the cornea. So it ignores the rest of the eye. So by going from, um, from here, let me get my arrow here, F going from here to here, the difference looks like what? This is the difference achieved. This looks like a hyperopic treatment. And guess what? Hyperopic treatments in a emetropic eye create myopia. So it's simple, plain optics. There's no magic here. So let's look at another uh, case. This is a little bit more difficult case. This is one of the first ectasia cases that we treated. And you can see that this case here, I'm going to try, I don't know if I can zoom up here. I can if I go back and I zoom up the slide. All right, so let's do it manually here. So let's look at this case alone. So we all agree that this is a keratoconus case. We do because the device says here that it's stage two keratoconus and we have inferior steepening. So we're able to laser this eye, combine of course with cross-linking and come to this picture where if we look at the uh, pentacam topometric indices, there's no keratoconus anymore. More importantly, the IHD has improved from 106 to 008. So the IHD, the index of height decentration, who knows what the IHD is? If the only thing you carry out of this room today is knowledge of what the IHD is, my work is done. The IHD is one of your options on your Pentacam when you press on topometric indices. Oculus is very cryptic about telling you how they calculate this, but in essence, it goes to the steepest part of the cornea, and then it goes to the diametrically opposite part of the cornea in regard to the vertex, and measures that difference. Actually, it takes several spots. So it takes several spots here and several spots here, and it measures that within your optical zone, how much irregularity is there? Index of height decentration. The normal is under 0 0.016. So normal eyes have an IHD, and you don't have to know the number, it will flag here yellow if it's borderline. So if it's over 0 0.016 on your Pentacam, it will flag yellow. Obviously, the lower it is, the better the patient sees. And this holds true for if you're prescribing glasses, if you're doing cataract surgery, or if you're doing laser vision correction. So the IHD, in a way, directly associates to quality of vision because it evaluates the cornea symmetry. The catch here is that, unfortunately, the IHD is not measuring total cornea power. It's measuring only anterior cornea power. So although the Pentacam is looking at mostly total cornea power, the topometric indices are designed to give you anterior cornea power. So, we were able to basically normalize the IHD, make a stage two keratoconus to a non-keratoconic eye, and I think the picture speaks to itself. So we're seeing the dramatic and drastic improvement. But of course, everything I will tell you today and I'll describe today has a catch. What is the catch? What if I told you that the refractive here of this patient, the refraction of this patient here, is half adapter myopia. And the patient is 2020 minus without glasses and 2020 with half adapter of myopia. And it's a 19 year old male. What do you think the refraction is here? Positive. 
Positive is a good point. How about if I told you that the actual length is 24? Will that help? Actual length 24. Keratometry here is an average 44, 42, 43. So it should be plano, maybe a little bit more because keratoconic eyes have a deeper chamber. So your cornea is sitting a little bit forward. It's more, uh, uh, and this is the anterior cornea surface. So the back cornea surface has a high negative power. So the keratometry um, should be in total of about 42. The problem is that this patient here could be 2020 uncorrected, and here could be three diopters of myopia. Why? I'm sorry? But that should correct myopia, right? So if you go from 53 to 43, you're flattening the cornea, you're correcting myopic, myopic correction. Why should the patient go from plano to minus three? Because keratoconic patients don't want to walk around falling into doors, crashing their cars. They work with what they have and they change their vertex. So a keratoconic patient is not seeing through this point here. They pick a sweet spot. This is a multifocal cornea. And this cornea is indeed very uh, steep down here. So the steepest point down here is 53. But remember, the point up here is 42. So the keratoconic patient has a whole staircase here from 53 to 42 to work with. Well, guess which step the patient is going to choose? the one that fits him or her best. It's the rule of nature. So they will play around. Next time you refract a keratoconic patient, don't look at his eyes or his face. Look at his body. He's going to change the position in the chair because he's going to try and move his head downwards so he can look through the sweet spot, which is usually just superior to the cone. This is a surprise you have to be familiar with and you have to explain to patients beforehand. Because there's no question that this cornea gives better quality. This patient, when they turn 68 and they have cataract surgery, will do far better. It'll be far easier to calculate an IOL for this patient than this patient, than this patient same patient with different cornea. But it's very hard to explain to a 19-year-old and their 45-year-old parents who paid 3,000 euro for the procedure, that this is better at three diopters of myopia and uncorrected 2060 than this with plantar refraction and 2020 uncorrected. So these are, I want to clue you in on some of the surprises that topography guided may encase because topography just looks at the cornea, it's trying to reshape the cornea, and if you're dealing with keratoconus, patients have a multifocal cornea, they will pick the best spot of the cornea to look out from. And that's not representative of the refraction. What we do now in order to predict roughly what the refractive error would be in a patient, I would look at the keratometry, 53. This happens to be one of the best normalization results I've ever had. Normally in a keratoconus, the superior, if this is 53, this would be about 33. Because equally as the cone bulges out here, the superior cornea sinks. So if this was 53 and this was 33, when you normalize it, at best, you'll end up with a 48. So with an actual length of 24 and with keratometry 48, I can predict that that patient will be between minus 3 and minus 4 and tell him beforehand. This is a tough lesson to learn and a tough thing to explain. And even if you explain it, that patient will be sitting next to one of your LASIK patients that came in with a minus three and is walking around uncorrected 2010. Question, please. So, in that scenario, angle kappa right? It's a very good point. It's very difficult to measure angle kappa because the angle kappa measures the difference between the center of the pupil 
and the vertex. Uh, so it's not a, if the ch patient changes position on the vertical axis, it not, it's not necessary that they will change the position of the pupil. The shape of the pupil will change if you're tilting the, the pupil up and down. The shape will change. So the angle kappa may, may not change. But that's a great area to look into whether angle kappa after normalization of the cornea changes. Because that would entail that the visual axis has changed. Okay. Of course, you can retreat. And, and it, this cornea, even if this cornea has a refractive error, it, it's a very simple, spherical, usually, correction. You don't have a lot to play with here. You have a normal cornea. Uh, you're, let's say you have to treat the minus one and a half or a plus two. You just do a hyperopic correction centered on the vertex. I have two questions for Lady. How, how long do you wait between one procedure? Because they are telling us that we have to do that. So provided we take two procedures, like you said, how long do you wait between one and the second? That's an excellent question. Only God knows. Because the question translates, and it's a very good question, when is this cornea stable? Uh, we have a presentation in this meeting looking at the epithelial remodeling after the combined procedures. And uh, usually, in my experience, these eyes stabilize refractively by month three to six. But we've also published 10-year data showing that there's a slight tendency towards the cornea flattening. And in 2% of the cases, the cornea flattens a lot. Due to cross-linking, and there seems to be an added effect through the years, it's very difficult to explain to you, but in the most simple terms, in the way I understand it, when you cross-link a cornea, you obviously, by default, cross-link more the center of the cornea, which is the thinnest part of the cornea, too. And everything shrinks down. So through the years, there's going to be some elasticity the other way around. So everything's going to expand a little bit. Right? The peripheral cornea is 650 microns. The central cornea is 400 microns. So let's assume that the central cornea expands 10 microns. The peripheral cornea, if it expands 10 microns for 400 microns, my math is, is about 2%, uh, 3%, 2.5%. So the 650 microns times 2% is 40 microns expansion. So what does that do? It makes the central cornea flatten. So it creates more myopia. So your center may be here 42, and 10 years down the line, it could be 37. Not because some secret magic uh, uh, entity goes in there and makes that cornea stiffer and stiffer and stiffer. It's because we have created a differential in cornea biomechanics. We have stiffened part of the cornea more than another part of the cornea. And that happens by default. Um, we have worked on that. It's not in the context of this talk, but we've published on how to use UV light in different patterns, and this is approved outside the US, to, to take advantage of this effect and get predictable refractive changes in, in the cornea of small magnitude. You can correct the minus one, minus one and a half, plus one, a little bit of astigmatism by using a certain pattern and taking advantage of this. See, our whole talk is going to be one slide today. I love the subject. It's so complicated. Yes, question. So, uh, let's say you have a credit position cross-link and then you follow up with a guided PRK and then you have a a very good question as well. Nobody knows the answer. This is an area of debate for surgeons. It's an area of debate whether you should do sequential, cross-link first, come back and do laser at a second time if needed. Uh, we've answered that question back in 2009 where we published two separate case series, the sequential approach and the combined approach. 
The combined approach, although more predictable, tends to give you a synergistic effect. So cross-linking gives you one and a half, two adapters of flattening. When you do a topo-guided fix on keratoconic eye, the most you can treat is about two diopters. There's not a lot of room there. And these topography-guided treatments use a lot of tissue to normalize. So all you can treat is two diopters with the cross-linking at best, and another two with laser. When you do both together, you can get anywhere from six to 16 diopters. So which one of the two you would choose in a cornea that's 58? So you have a cornea that's steepest point is 58. So you're gonna go with two diopters cross-linking, you go to 56. How much are you gonna laser that 56? Two diopters? Let's say three. So it'll be 53. You still will have a very regular cornea. For a patient who cannot wear a contact lens, you need to do a transplant. So the name of the game here is not what's the best way to do this, is how better to avoid a cornea transplant. Nobody knows this answer uh, precisely. But we have shown, if we, we have in our center, we've reported, and it's now peer-reviewed literature, over 60 papers looking case by case, two and a half thousand eyes treated with a combined procedure. And we are uh, reporting the good cases and the surprise cases as well. And in this meeting this morning, I presented a paper showing that if these eyes turn hyperopic, even if they're 380 in thickness, a hyperopic correction is peripheral, you can do a hyperopic PRK and reshape them. It's still better than doing a transplant. So, granted, your refractive result is unknown. If anybody tells you that I know how to take this cornea, this is a post-cornea uh, ulcer, contact lens wearer, and you should show pictures like this to your contact lens wearers that say, I'm afraid of having LASIK or PRK. I tell them it's like somebody driving into our office with a uh, motorbike and saying, I'm afraid of cars. Yeah, you can get killed with both. But a motorbike is more dangerous than a car. And a contact lens wearer with the peer review literature today has one in 1,000 chances over 10 years wear to get a serious cornea infection where with a laser vision correction procedure, you have one in 5,000 chances, or 8,000, depending what literature you read, to get a serious cornea infection. So it's five to eight times safer. So there is refractive unpredictability when you achieve such huge changes in the cornea. Let's look at this case. This is a post, I don't know if that, the image is big enough. This is a patient who was a contact lens wearer, she had an ulcer. She was treated in a state hospital in Athens. Of course, everything on the shelf was thrown on the eye. This is another area of debate. When is it that we start using corticosteroids in a cornea ulcer? If we discuss it in this room, it's impossible for us to agree. So one of the issues with treating cornea ulcers is that most likely people start using steroids too late because they're timid that the steroids, for a good reason, will advance keratolysis and advance uh, a fungal infection or the microbial straight, uh, uh, spread. But the corticosteroids are the ones that are going to rehabilitate the cornea. So once you feel the ulcer is becoming better, you have to take a very tough decision if the ulcer is central to the visual axis. When is it that you're gonna start steroids? So not to leave subject, Obviously, steroids were started very late here. The cornea contracted. And what you're seeing here is a flattening of the inferior part of the cornea that created a steepening of the superior part of the cornea. So this looks like a cone that's upside down. It's a, as if we're looking at, at a keratoconic patient that's upside down. The difference here is that this steep area is not thin. In keratoconus, steeper means thinner. The difference here is that this flat area is thin. This is the area that has contracted from the ulcer scarring. So what do you do? I trained in New York and Boston that if a patient like this did not rehabilitate well at the time with RGPs, currently with RGPs or scleral lenses, 
you need to do a cornea transplant. Best corrected vision here with glasses is 2060. And you can imagine what it feels driving at night with a cornea like this. So topography guided is able to map this cornea and normalize it. And the result is impressive. If you look at the difference map, this is the difference between post-op subtracted from pre-op. You can see the precision of the correction. You can see that the laser worked exactly at the area that it should have worked, and this entails psychorotation adjustment. Of course, one will ask, what is the refraction here, and what is the refraction here? And the sad thing with our work is that the patient only understands uncorrected visual acuity. So if you show this picture to that patient and you tell them, you did great, and in this point here, she was seeing 2040, and here she's seeing uncorrected 2080, she's sad because her uncorrected is worse. But here you put a minus four contact lens, and she's 2015. So this is the difficulty about discussing with patients, having all this information in your informed consent, and having them understand that topograph this type of topographic guided treatments are therapeutic treatments. They are meant to normalize cornea regularity. Their goal is to have better quality of vision and uh, better function. We'd like to predict the refractive effect. It's impossible. It's impossible to predict what this difference would bring into the eye refractive-wise. Because this flat area has steepened and this steep area has flattened. So it's very difficult, it's impossible. I've done over 4,000 eyes. Till the date, I cannot make that prediction. So let's jump to keratoconus. So this is good, good prelude to what we're gonna talk about now. Cross-thinking keratoconic eye before and after. And we have an improvement of about two diopters. This is the difference, this is what we achieved with cross-thinking alone. But still, the patient cannot function well here because he's contact lens intolerant and he's spectacle corrected 2060. So he's done a procedure, he suffered for three months, and he's like, doctor, I still can't function. I can't drive at night. <clears throat> they fired me for work because I made mistakes with numbers. So this is where we employed a topography-guided treatment. This was way back, this is in 2003. Uh, this was published in the Journal of Cornea in 2007. It took us three years to find a journal that would publish uh, the, uh, the anathema doing laser on a keratoconic eye. But the pure motivation here is that we still had to do a cornea transplant on this patient because he was unhappy and he could not function with a gas permeable contact lens. So we perform a topography-guided treatment on here, and this was a sequential treatment. So cross-linking first, six months later, uh, laser treatment, and this is what the eye ended up after the laser treatment. I think we can all agree this is a far better uh, cornea topography than this one, and of course, much far better than this one. The problem in doing a sequential treatment is by removing this much tissue we have removed the most strengthened tissue in the anterior stroma. So we have weakened the cornea again. And nobody knows if that cornea is going to go again into ectasia. So that is the single most important argument on doing sequential treatments. Cross-thinking first and laser afterwards. Because when you come back with your laser, your cornea is not cross-linked throughout the same. It's cross-linked more in the anterior 50 microns, less in the 50 microns under that, less in the 50 microns under that, and less in the 50 microns under that, for a total of about 300 microns, max. But the effective cross-linking is in the top 100 microns. And this is the other eye of that patient within a year time worsening. This is, we've published this, or uh, this is a post-LASIK ectasia. This is a real case as well here. This was a uh, young firefighter in New York who was a helicopter fighter. He, uh, a helicopter pilot, I'm sorry. 
Um, I kind of gave it away, but anyway. And he had LASIK, and he was an eye rubber, so he developed keratoconus. So they grounded him from the helicopter. He came, he flew from uh, Queens to Athens. This was in 2005. And he said, listen, if I have a transplant, I can't fly anymore. My passion in life is flying. Can we fix this? And we discussed everything that I've discussed with you today. Some of our informed consents, my discussion with the patient, I don't consider an informed consent a sheet that the patient has to sign. I personally discuss with every patient, most of the principles I'm sharing with you now are available on our YouTube channel. It's laser vision and you can go on there and listen to how we describe this to patients. Some of them are in English, not everything is in Greek. So you're welcome to sit and listen the question of the patients, how do we answer, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we perform the Athens protocol here. We treated him with topography guided uh, and CXL. This is the picture afterwards. Uh, this is the treatment, the laser treatment, and this is the uh, change between before and after. So we can see that uh, uh, we did fix the irregularity. We did stabilize the cornea. I saw the patient at uh, three months. He came back to Athens. He was miserable because he was still healing from the cross-linking. He was about 20, 40. He said, I'm not comfortable flying yet. I told him, wait, see how things happen. It's very difficult to, to, to follow patients through such a big distance. And I lost track of him. And four years later, a friend of his came in with the same problem. He had post-LASIK ectasia, and he flew to Greece. This was in now in 2008. Still not FDA approved to do topo-guided or cross-linking in the U.S. So I said, what happened to so-and-so, uh, to our friend? He's like, whoa, you didn't hear. Guess what this guy ended up doing? Our friend is uh, a fighter pilot for the U.S. Navy. He achieved vision of 2010. He enlisted with the Navy, and he's flying F-16s. At least he was until 2016. Now, not every case is like this. We can't promise 2016 vi vision when we treat ectasia, but this is a, a documented example of how this uh, can work. So let's go through, uh, now that we got a little flavor of topo guided, let's go through some basic principles. The key thing before you think of topography guided is to understand what is it that your imaging devices show you and how they obtain these data. So I strongly recommend you go on our uh, YouTube channel and walk through this presentation. This is a presentation I put together for my residents at uh, NYU in New York. It's an hour plus course, and it goes through all the basic principles back from the uh, 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 basic keratometry devices, Placido, uh, computer topography, orb scan, sine fluke topography, OCT mapping, and how you have to create a sense of what is it that each of these device measures because they all give color maps and they're not, they don't all mean the same in how you can use these to assess your patients first and then treat. So it was not until the FDA trial for topo guide in the US that was done on normal myopic eyes. So this is not sick eyes. This is not trying to fix irregular eyes. This is an attempt to use this technology in normal eyes and try and see how it pans out to get FDA approval to use it for normal eyes. And the surprise here is that, in contrast to any other laser platform that has gone through the FDA, and these are data available on the FDA, these are public data, you can click in on the um, FDA.gov site and find these data. This was assessed in 2014, but it's still out there. This was the highest laser, uh, customized laser, and still to the date, data on gain in lines of vision. When we say in refractive surgery, someone gained lines of vision, we compare pre-op best corrected to post-op uncorrected. So that is called lines of vision gained. And almost 30-something uh, percent of the patients gained lines of vision. This was the US FDA topography guided study for the Alcon laser. And I'm gonna try and explain to you here why topography guided may have some sense in improving vision. 
Forget about the lines and whatever on this uh, patient. Do we all agree that this is a normal astigmatic eye? Right? This is normal with the rule of astigmatism. So this patient, let's assume this patient is minus 5, minus 1, says, Doctor, I want to have laser. I have money, cash with me here in my bag. I want to have it done today. Can I do it today? There's nothing wrong with this patient. Pentacam is fine. Thickness is fine. He's been off contact lenses. What's tricky about this case? The tricky thing is that we all agree here that the astigmatism is almost on that with the rule. Right? It's a vertical bow tie. His refractive astigmatism is way off. So his refraction, dry, wet, autorefractor, and wavefront is different. Why is that? Who wants to take a pitch on why is it that the topographic refraction is different than the manifest refraction as far as the amount of cylinder and the axis of cylinder? And we're not talking about two or three degrees being off axis. The axis here is off almost 30 degrees. I'm sorry? Lens tilt is a good uh, thought. How many lenses do you think are tilted in human eyes? Who are not boxers? There's some what? I'm sorry? No, the epithelium is pristine. Epithelium is pristine. Tendicam is pristine. Why would a patient like this have a different manifest refraction than the topographic? The answer to that question is here. And, and, uh, it could, or a chalasian, but that would make the uh, cornea imaging irregular. So what's happening here is that this patient has angle kappa. And look how asymmetric the pupillary border here is, the dotted line, to the vertex of the vision. The vertex here, where the patient is lined up looking at the placido target, is the first Purkinje image on the cornea. So theoretically, the line of sight goes through this little hole. Do we all agree? Now look how different this point is from the center of the pupil. On the vertical axis, the difference is on the x-axis, it's 30 microns. So on the x-axis, the, horizont the horizontal axis is 30 microns. By the way, on your pentacam, these numbers are down here. Each pentacam gives you the angle kappa in y and um, in x and y axis. On the y axis, it is 280 microns. So for this regular astigmatic eye, the cornea for the patient works like a prism. So the cornea is not sitting in the line of sight. It's sitting tilted from the line of sight. So you have a perfectly normal cornea that's tilted. So this creates coma. And this is what topography guided is trying to fix here. Topography guided is trying to, it's treating more here than here. Fine, the most evident thing here is the trifoil. But also, this is coma. It's going to treat more here. This is the topo guided set to zero refraction. So I'm telling the topographer, no refraction, no cylinder, no myopia, just normalize the cornea. It's going to normalize the cornea to the vertex. Because for the topographer, the cornea centers on the vertex, not on the pupillary center. So it tells me that it's one, it wants to normalize this normal cornea. Why would you want to normalize a normal cornea? Because the, patient's is, the patient is seeing out of a normal cornea eccentrically. And all hyperopes do. So for all hyperopes, every hyperope you've seen or you will meet in, the, in your life is looking through a prism if they have normal corneas. Because they're, they, they're all looking nasally, some almost one millimeter nasally from the center of the cornea. So not only are they looking through the prism of the astigmatism, but the cornea at one millimeter off center is not spherical. It's, it's like a wedge. So topography guided suggests that here, instead of treating the manifest 45 degree minus half axis, we treat one diopter at, at, at uh, 180 degrees. 
minus 1 at 180 degrees, right where the topography is. So this is a tough decision. What do you do? That patient will do very well with, a, and that's a very good point. If you do wafer optimized treatment, you will treat the refraction of the patient. The patient will retain this prism effect of the cornea. The patient will probably see 2020. He'll be very happy, but you will lose the opportunity to make this eye 2010. Because if you improve the optics of the cornea, most eyes can reach 2010, and the reason they don't is because nature is not able to calibrate everything at perfection. So this is the, the thing that you should not do, in my opinion, and that's, that's where a lot of people crashed and burned with Contura, thinking that topo guide is the holy, the golden uh, uh, solution, is do topo guided, which will normalize this cornea, and treat the astigmatic of the wafer-optimized uh, measurement. Because if you reshape the cornea, the refraction will change. Of course, to prove that, you have to first treat this, wait for a month, and do a refraction later. Who wants to bet that a, a month later, the refraction will be minus one at 180 degrees? Practice has proven that. So immediately you know more than 90% of our colleagues globally on how topography guided works on normal eyes. It's reshaping the cornea, it's making the cornea more symmetric to the vertex. Why is the vertex so important? Because everybody in this room is seeing through the vertex of their cornea. Nobody's looking through the center of the pupil. We're all seeing through the vertex of our cornea, fine. The vertex may change a little bit during the day. The, we know there's some centroid shift between morning and night and the activity that we're doing, but it's definitely not the center of the pupil for most people. And you'd be surprised if you, when you go back to your practice and you look at your Pentacam maps of all the laser treatments that you've done to realize how much angle kappa normal myopic eyes have. Because we were taught traditionally, I was taught too, both at Cornell and Harvard, that myopes don't have angle kappa. Angle kappa is a hyperopic thing. BS, meaning better science is, you have to look at the numbers. And the numbers prove the opposite. A lot of eyes have angle kappa. And that's what you can fix with topo guided. So here, we're switching the uh, cylinder since we're doing topo guided. And this is another example. Look, this example, this here has an, uh, an axis of about 30 degrees, but the manifest is at 160. How odd is this? The topographic astigmatism on the minus axis is here, right? I'm sorry, the manifest axis, negative axis is here. The topographic is here. So if you're going to do topo guided and you will normalize this cornea to the vertex, you have to pay more attention to the topography derived amount of astigmatism and axis of astigmatism. And now you know what TMR is, what we proposed as the topography modified refraction. This is not uh, Alpin's work where he said the real refraction is in the middle between your manifest and your topographic. This is the concept that if you normalize the cornea according to the vertex, the refraction will change. It's a different concept. It, it only entails to topo guided eyes. So let's look, this is what TMR can give you. Very high numbers and uh, uh, lines of vision gained. Yes? So in It's, it's a very good statement. If you don't have iris registration, you're probably better off treating wafer and optimized. Because if you zero your refraction on that contour patient, this is what the laser is going to do. If this is cyclorotated two degrees, 
Imagine this being psychorotated two degrees. You're aiming for, uh, find an island and be politically correct. All right, I won't find an island. You're trying to aim here and your laser will shoot there. Remember, every two degrees of psychorotation, if you're dealing with regular astigmatism, will demean your astigmatism by 8%. Same thing with toric IOLs. So if you're doing toric IOLs, shoot for the higher number of IOL, because it's almost impossible to get dot on your axis. So if you want to have the real axis, you're going to be about two degrees off. You might as well go with a higher power or toric IOL to be on target. Same thing here. So if you can't lock in psych rotation adjustment, you're better and you have a significant correction. Not every eye is this way. I'm showing you some extreme examples. If there's not significant coma, if this is an eye that's straightforward, it doesn't matter a lot. But if you see when, when zero is put on as a target refraction, that your laser is going to do a lot of work you may opt to do wavefront optimized, and I do that myself. If I see a very regular higher order aberration attempt by the laser, I don't want to deal with predicting what the refractive effect will be of that. I'd rather do a wavefront optimized treatment, which will give me a 2020 almost invariably. And if that patient has a problem in the future, then I can fix it with a topo guided fix. Chances are one in a hundred that you'll need that. Yes. Well, uh, I will. That's a good question. This is why we showed when we uh, randomly uh, treated one eye topo guided, one eye smile, that the uh, topo guided LASIK eyes did far better because of improvement of cornea optics and psychorotation adjustment. Smile is an excellent procedure, but it cannot psychorotate uh, the astigmatic correction. And you can see this here. This is the post-op astigmatism in the LASIK eyes, and this is the post-op astigmatism in the contralateral smile eyes. You can see that it's all over the place. A lot of the eyes have, excuse me, a doctor of astigmatism post-op, where none, almost nil, with the topo-guided LASIK. I'm sorry? You, you could, but the, the femto locks on the cornea, and when it locks, if you've done a smile procedure, it moves the cornea as it locks it in a little bit. So how do you know if it's rotated two degrees or five, or if you're on the vertex or off the vertex? Smile gets away because it, it creates a much broader flattening zone. So it forgives a lot of error there, and that's its advantage. So let's look at, uh, we only have uh, about half hour left. So I'm not going to talk a lot about um, the Athens protocol. We talked a little bit about it, doing a topo-guided normalization, then a PTK, uh, cross-linking, and mitomycin. You can get this type of normalization, which is very impressive. Uh, this is our study published in 2009 in Journal of Refractive Surgery showing that the combined eyes here did better than the sequential eyes, uh, far better, about two doctor better correction. Um, this is that same patient I showed you before. Of course, there's always complications with the combined. I want to underline that delayed healing, anterior cornea scarring, Overflattening, we talked about that, but with overflattening, you can still come back and do a laser treatment or a phacic IOL or a clear lens extraction if it's an older patient. This is looking at psychometric uh, indices of how these patients with keratoconus can function better, and we've published this uh, several years ago showing that this procedure actually improves quality of, of life for keratoconic patients uh, inequivocally. This is using a pattern UV projection. This device is approved outside the U.S. since 2013. Unfortunately, it's not FDA approved yet. It used to be a Vidra. It's now Glaucos. I don't know where they are in their FDA trials, but you can see here that it can project UV light 
in different patterns, and each pattern can have different fluence. It's the, same as pixel that you it's the pixel that we started. We did the first uh, uh, clinical results in Europe. These are from 2013. This used to be called the KXL2 device. It's called now the Mosaic device. But it's, it's fantastic technology if you want to go this route. Uh, and it can give you an extra kick in employing the differential and the fluence of cross-linking to add a refractive effect. But I think it goes out of context of what we're going to talk about today. What I'd like to talk about today is uh, a little bit about diagnostics. All right, so let's go back to the question. Who's a good candidate for a customized treatment? Let's assume these two eyes here are minus four, 2020, stable for five years. Would you trust, and these are epithelial maps, would you trust the same, the customized data from this epithelial map or from this one? Who votes left? No punt intended. And who votes right? This epithelium is unstable. This patient should not, in my opinion, be considered for a customized ablation because the data are skewed. This is a more naive cornea, and we've written the literature with this particular device, with the OptiView device, what is normal? Human cornea epithelium is one of the most stable metrics in the human body. It's kind of like the core temperature of our body. Everywhere on the planet, man or woman, Regardless of age, regardless of refractive error, everybody has cornea thickness in their epithelium with this device, 51 microns. The problem with the epithelium measurements is that they're not specific to what's going wrong. So it could be that the patient rubbed their eyes. It could be that there's sand. It could be that they have allergies. It could be that they had blepharitis. It could be that they just took off their contact lenses. But still, this is a more irregular cornea than this is. And uh, one of the points is cornea irregularity through the uh, epithelial maps. The other one, this is just study in the past looking at wafer guided treatments as a repair tool. We published this in 2005. But the problem with Wavefront, and this answers the question about lenticular astigmatism, because Wavefront measures high and lower aberrations within the eye, lens and vitreous. And this is the wavefront measured dynamically through time. Each line is a, an eye, and this is a wavefront measurement through a time lapse. It's dynamic. So which wavefront do I treat? This, 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 or this? Which one does the patient use most of the time? Nobody knows. So lenticular astigmatism or vitreous contribution to refractive error is something that's dynamic. How can you put a number on it? My opinion is that it's a compensatory mechanism to, to help the patient with uh, cornea aberrations, but, and we learn this when we do cataract surgery, that the astigmatism the patient has at the end of the day is the astigmatism of the cornea. That's it. There's no astigmatism from the vitreous or something else, if your lens is centered and in the back. So, uh, these are all the diagnostics that we use. Of course, it's hard to have these. We don't have these in the New York office. We have about 50 diagnostic in the Greek office. And you have to learn how to read these devices. This is a medical legal case I saw five years ago in New York. Three really big names in the US claimed that this was, patient had LASIK, labeled this as post-LASIK ectasia. And I came in as an expert witness for the court to defend the surgeon. Is this post-LASIK ectasia? This patient had LASIK. Who votes LASIK ectasia? All right, good point. We're way ahead. So let's look at all the uh, goodies the uh, uh, sign fluke imaging can give us. We agree this is a decentered, inferior, steep, steep and cornea, but, and this is also reflected by the anterior elevation on the cornea, but look at the posterior elevation. It's from a different planet. And look at the cornea pachymetry. The steepest part of the cornea is not the thinnest part of the cornea. So what happened here? This was a decentered, mixed astigmatic 
correction. The laser is shot elsewhere. So it moved the hyperopic optical zone inferiorly. So does this patient need cross-linking? No. What does this patient need? A topo-guided fix. Or if you can do it away from guided, away from guided fix. But it does not need cross-linking. It is fixable. It's a problem of the laser or the surgeon, but it's not ectasia. So this is why we should be careful to read what we we're seeing, this is a, an extreme example. I don't know if you're familiar with, France, with uh, central cloudy dystrophy of Francois. It's more of a cornea uh, mind game, but it's, it looks like crocodile chagrin in the center of the cornea. It, it appears in older age, and the only thing it does, it has no other optical consequence, is it makes uh, several devices go crazy. The Pentacam goes crazy, because it reads this cloudiness as abnormality Remember, the pentacam takes light slices of the cornea. So if the cornea is not clear, pristine clear, these slices will be irregular. So the pentacam reads this cornea as such. The placido topography reads a little bit with the rule of astigmatism. But remember, the placido has no real data on the center. The placido starts to read from the first ring to the second. So the center in placido maps should be a black circle with a question mark on it. We have no idea what's going on in the center. For all we know, the central cornea could have a hole in it. Placido mapping would be perfect because it's not measuring in the center. Now, uh, Cassini, it didn't see its, its, uh, its glory. This is a different reflection topography that also has central data, shows a little bit against the rule of astigmatism. And the Clinical value here is that this was a lady who I did cataract surgery on. I plan for all my patients to be about half adapter with the rule astigmatic after the procedure. And I use the T2 lens here, not available in the US, but available in Europe, just one adapter of astigmatism to convert her against the rule astigmatism with the rule astigmatism. And if I used any other uh, keratometric device, I would be wrong. Actually, any other topographic device the interferometry keratometry was correct. So just to show you how things could be different from one device to the other. Um, let me see what else I have here. That's a very good point, and there's not a good answer for that as well. Uh, it's very unusual that your topographic data will be very different than your manifest. If they are, you need to validate your topographic data with total cornea data. So you always have to correlate. Unfortunately, in the US, the only topo guided available is the one using reflection topography. So it's reading the anterior part of the cornea only. So you want to go to your pentacam and make sure that the pentacam shows similar amount of astigmatism and axis. Because your topographer may say two diopters at 90 degrees and your pentacam may say 0.75 diopters at 80 degrees. Can anybody think of a pathology that could create that? I'm sorry? Posterior stigmatism, exactly. But why? What are things that can cause posterior stigmatism that can be diagnosed in a slit lab? We're doing our cornea boards here. Polymorphous. Did I hear polymorphous? That's a good point. The most dramatic, though, in changing significantly astigmatism is uh, birth injury with uh, forceps. It'll split the cornea, and you can be a hero by seeing that on a slit lamp. It, lo it almost looks like hop striae that congenital glaucoma has. So you see a split in decimates that's usually uh, oblique. It's only in one eye, because the forceps cannot hit both the embryo, the fetus's eyes. It's impossible. And if you ask the mom, you know, we have the advantage that Greek men, even when they're 40, they come in with their mothers. So their mothers are in the room, 
And you ask him, did you ever have any injury at birth? And, you know, he says, I don't know. And the mom says, yes, when they brought little Nicholas uh, uh, at the maternity, maternity hall, he had a bruise over his uh, right eye. And mom always remembers. So uh, a, that would be a rare case that uh, your topography uh, data would significantly differ from your total cornea data that the pentacam would give and your manifest refraction. Or if you had posterior lenticonus, or if you had the posterior polymorphous dystrophy, I don't know if you're familiar with that, it's kind of rare, but that kind of disturbs the backside of the cornea. But you'd be surprised how many corneas are not minus six in total cornea power that we all assume that all corneas are. And this is important for your IOL calculation when you do cataract surgery, because remember, being off on your keratometry, one diopter will change your predictability in your cataract surgery by 0.9 diopters. It's not negligible. We pay so much attention to measuring actual length uh, accurately, but we're very, very loose on keratometries. So we go with our interferometry keratometries that are surface keratometries, and they only measure the central 2.8 to 3 millimeters of cornea, not total cornea. And we're assuming that the backside of the cornea is bringing in minus 6, and it's all spherical or has very low astigmatism, which is usually the rule, but not always. So we, uh, we have about 20 minutes left. Let me speak a little bit about ray tracing, and then I think it's probably worth going in and designing a case or two topo-guided. All right, so let's choose a case. You want to do a virgin eye, you want to do a keratoconic eye, or you want to do a scarred eye in designing. Who wants to pick? A cone. All right. So I'm holding that. Uh, we'll do a cone, and I'll speak a little bit about ray tracing. Ray tracing is a new concept where we're dealing with um, this is a device that's on the exhibit made by Oculus, and it can measure. It's basically a Pentacam HR. It has an interferometer in it, and it also has a Hartman Shack wafer and analyzer. So what it does, it, use the, it uses the interferometry data shown here to create a 3D model of the eye. And then it uses the Hartman Shack wafer data to do ray tracing on that 3D avatar eye of each patient that it measures from the retina to the front part of the lens, 2,000 rays. And then 2,000 rays from your sign fluke imaging from the device to the front part of the lens again. So it uses these two ray tracing analysis to give you refractive um, look in lower aberrations, myopia astigmatism, and higher aberrations. So it does what we did in TMR automatically. You press a button, number comes out. So what Alcom Wavelight has used this device, they call it the sitemap. It is currently in, in uh, FDA trial in the US. It has been, sorry again, see marked in Europe since November of 2019. So we were the first center globally to work with this. Um, and uh, it does give pristine results, similar to our topography TMR work, but without any of the math and the jotting down and looking at the exams because all of this is done automatically by the software. So the software calculates lower order, higher aberrations. Uh, it looks at the amount of myopia. It has data in that have to do with healing um, in a LASIK procedure, which obviously would be different if you're doing a minus two or a minus six, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we pre we're presenting this at this meeting tomorrow. Um, and um, just to prelude uh, what we're uh, going to be present, I'll just show you one or two slides. We're seeing a lot of lines gained in these eyes. Uh, of course here, and I'm answering to your question, we exclude cases that the epithelium looks like this. This would not be a case I would do with ray tracing or topo guided because the epithelium is irregular. And I would also exclude, and please note that the machine does not flag it as irregular here. So the machine gives me pristine data. This is a very precise machine. So it's lacking information on the epithelial mapping. And also, Pentacam, this is a different case. Pentacam looks great here, doesn't it? Everything is fantastic. Good thickness, front, back, topography. Machine says everything's good. 
Look at the Placido image. Does this look regular? There's a lot of noise. It looks shaky. So this is an irregular surface, and you can see how bad the epithelium is. This is a contact lens abuser. The epithelium looks blue. Blue epithelium is a sad epithelium. There's almost limbal stem cell deficiency. So you don't want to use customized data on this patient. So if they want to have laser, I'll do wafer and optimized on them. But I would ideally prefer to improve the ocular surface to get more stable data. I will get more stable data if this is just limbal stem cell deficiency from contact lens abuse. I will not if this is ABM dystrophy. Because anterior basement membrane dystrophy in the morning can give you similar images on placido disc topography. So if it's an ABM dystrophy case, you need to do PRK. Two birds, one stone. All right, so I'm not going to, I could sit here till Christmas and talk about topography guided. I would recommend to you to email us any question regarding a case. This is our hobby. We love doing this. Um, and we will go on to our treatment computer to design together a topography guided case. So let me see how I'm going to do that. I need to find a little, I love the arrow adapters. Uh, and please share with me if you have any questions. You need this adapter to access the, or can we, or can we not? Now, this does not have a USB-C port. You got, you got the right one? No, I need the older port for the Macs. Yeah, I need that one. The older yeah, port for the yeah. Mac. You need that right there. Yeah. All right, that's okay. We'll, uh, we'll do it. I have some cases here. We'll do it a different way. Okay. Okay. So here we are. Let's go find our topo guided cases. All right. Let's find this fellow here. This was actually case treated in the U.S. I'm not sure I was. Let's look at the pre-op data. Oh. All right. And who's voting that this here is keratoconus? OK. Patient had cross-linking two years ago. He's miserable. He's an investment banker in New York. 28, he probably makes five times the money I do, but that's life. And uh, he's been told to have a cornea transplant. There's no other solution. So do we graft this guy? He cannot wear contact lenses. He's best corrected 2030, but he's terrible when he goes back to New Jersey driving from New York, and it also uh, ruins his golf game because he has poor quality of vision when, when lights get a little bit dim. So we have keratoconus here. We're confirming that the thinnest part of the cornea is also the steepest, the concavity in the back side of the cornea, the elevation in the front part of the cornea. So let's go and design the treatment. And I presented this today, how you would treat a patient like this. Let's look at the epithelial maps. Just to get an idea of what the epithelium is doing to improve the prerogative of this patient. See how the epithelium is blue here and almost brown around. So this is about 30 microns thick here. It's almost 70 out here. So it's doing a tremendous effort to kind of bury that cone. The other thing it's telling me is that this guy is rubbing his eyes. So even if he swears he doesn't rub his eyes, you need to have him tape himself the nights that he sleeps alone uh, on how he sleeps, because you will prove to him that he rubs his eyes during his sleep. Remember, 
I would like the day that when we talk about keratoconus, we say keratoconus is not a non-inflammatory progressive thinning of the cornea, but the problem that you are gen genetically predisposed to and you develop if you rub your eyes. That will be the day that I will be happy. And also the day that we screen teenagers for keratoconus globally, and we don't have to deal with this anymore. There's a vaccine out there, two vaccines. The first vaccine is don't rub your eyes. The second is have cross-linking. And we're done. Case closed, we go home, have lunch. So if none of this happens and the patient is rubbing his eyes, and for me, this is an eye rubber here, you need to do something about it. So let's look at our laser. We're going to go to look at our treatment data. Uh, do, 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 do. Treatment data. All right, so let's look at our treatment data. This is, I promise you, the re zero refraction, and this is what you have to do for those of you who use, and the only topo-guided platform available in the U.S. is the wave light. So these are the treatment data, and remember, you have to, in my opinion, you have, this should have been the default view on every topo-guided. The first thing that should come out on your treatment computer should have been the zero refraction treatment because this will show you what the device will do to treat this patient. And you want to have this side by side with this picture here. So does this make sense? Does this treatment make sense for this cornea? It does. Well, ray tracing does something even better little pearl here. Ray tracing is not looking only at the cornea. Ray tracing is looking at this cornea here, not just as, as an irregular cornea, but as a cornea that's tilted to the optics of the eye. So it looks at this cornea as something that's bulging inferiorly and flattened superiorly. So it looks at the lens of the eye and the cornea and a keratoconic cornea, ray tracing reads it as such. So the beauty of that is if you treat this with ray tracing, it's going to treat more of the hyperopic arc up here and less on the cone, where it hurts the most, where it's the thinnest. Plus, it's going to take into account also the posterior coma, which we're not here. We're treating just the anterior coma. We're not treating the posterior coma here. So this is our treatment. Now, things that you have to swallow, which are difficult to swallow, is refractive cylinder, 2.75 diopters at 170 degrees. Topographic cylinder, if you fix the cornea, less than a diopter at 28 degrees. This is a tough road to cross. And this is what led us to TMR in, in uh, believing and seeing in the results that uh, even normal eyes can benefit from recentering the cornea to the vertex and being able to do this. Why is this happening to this patient? I think we talked about it before. It's happening because the patient is not seeing through here. The patient is seeing when he's refracted somewhere around this line here. And what's the astigmatism out here? Only God knows. It's what the patient is able to get to get the best possible image. That and squinting and tilting his head and moving around, et cetera, et cetera. So once we reshape this cornea, and I'm reading down here 51, up here 40. So we have a staircase of 10 diopters here. So once we reshape this cornea, then we will know what the rear refraction of this patient is. So our work here is to reshape the cornea. So we feed the device here with the uh, topography guided fix, which is this here. I would always put, and you can see our technicians do it by default, I will always put in here the axis of the astigmatism that the topography is measuring. I would treat one diopter of astigmatism at most, and from the 275 diopters of myopia, maybe two or three. How much thickness do we have here? Well, we have good thickness. We're at 473, so we have room to work. But still, because there may be a refractive surprise, 
Even if this patient is a minus three, I will not be tempted to treat the full refractive error. Because remember what I told you, when you combine the two procedures, number one, you can get a lot of flattening, and we'll see how much flattening he got. Number two, then once the cornea is normalized, you have an idea what the real refraction of this patient is. Right now, you're getting something that's dynamic and may not be true. So let's look at the post-op. So are we happy? Do we achieve our goal? This is a good result. How do I judge my result? I go to the difference map and then try and see how the difference map resembles topographically the cone. And it's right on the point. It's spot on. Well, you're speaking to someone who's very, I've published a lot on Contura, and uh, I think that if your topography suggested numbers are confirmed by your Pentacam, I would treat 100% the topography amount and axis of cylinder. The, the, the caveat here, the pearl here, is that we did a study that we're publishing now that even if you go 50%, towards the amount of cylinder that topography wants to do. So you split it in half, and you do 50% of the angle difference, you get almost 85% of the benefit. The angle difference so even if you split in half, you get almost the full effect. So in your first steps, you know, I understand it's a big leap of faith. It's very difficult treating something that you're not measuring. We all, we all trust our measurements, but remember, the patient is using the cornea as a prism, and that's why they're seeing this way. So this is the normalization. Now, depending on the cornea thickness, I'd like not to exceed 50, 60 microns. In this case, we could have, because this minimal thickness is 480. It's different when you have a cornea that's 420. And it's very difficult when you have a cornea that's 395. So what do you tell a 19-year-old boy in Greece who's 395, okay, we do a transplant? Do you think he's gonna stop rubbing his eyes after the transplant? Do you think he understands at 19 what rubbing his eyes and having a second transplant means? Yes, uh, what I, I wanna finish here a little bit. Look what's changed here. If you look at the central keratometry here, we're at 45, where the central keratometry here is at 43 and maybe 48. So it is not a surprise if this patient here ends up more myopic than he started. So this is not a surprise for me. If the actual length of this patient is 25 with a 46 cornea, he's gonna be minus four. It's all SRK formula. It's pure math. So if it's a 25-millimeter eye and it has 45, 46 keratometry, it's going to be a minus 4, no question asked. So you can kind of tell this before you do the procedure. You can have a rough estimate. So if you, you wanted to see the treatment plan, let me just finish here in his post-op. Do I have an epi map? No, I don't, unfortunately. All right, so let's go to the treatment plan. So what I did treat here, and we'll see it because... Let's do first what I would uh, treat today and see if I did the right thing. So on this patient, I have his refraction, right? I have his refraction, minus three, roughly, minus three at 170. So the spherical equivalent here is minus one and a half and minus three, minus four and a half, let's say minus four. He's a minus four spherical equivalent. So what I would treat is, since I can only treat the adopter of astigmatism, I would do actually 0 0.75, 0 0.75 at 28 degrees. So from the four adopters of spherical equivalent, that leaves minus 370. 
So I would probably treat three doctors with myopia. The problem is the, in the U.S., you're stuck in stopping at six millimeter diameter. You can't go thinner. You can't go narrower. Outside the U.S., you can go all the way down to five millimeters, enlarge your transition zone, and remove less tissue. But anyway, but even if this cornea, let's assume, let's do another one, and I'll close with this. And this will really make you think. Let's assume this patient has cornea thickness of 390. Patient is 390. Okay? How can I fix this cornea? How can I do laser on a 390 cornea? If I use this, it's going to remove from the cone uh, 60 microns. So it's going to go to 330. What's a smart way to normalize the cornea and not take any tissue out of the cone? You can start adding. You cannot do this in the U.S., but internationally, you can go here and start putting plus. So go plus one, plus one and a half, plus two, plus two and a half, and eventually, this will go away. This will be zero. So you'll be doing a hyperopic normalization of the cornea. Of course, you will expect this eye to become very myopic, but you can fix that. You can put a fake IOL. So if the patient understands, that's the way to do it. In the US, you can't do plus, but you can shoot this on the epithelium, as it is, and not do a hyperopic treatment afterwards or do the hyperopic treatment. If I was doing this in the US, on the epithelium without scraping, I would have to add to the minus 275, I would have to add another 275 for the epithelium. So I would have to treat uh, minus five and a half, minus 0.75 at 28 degrees, right? And then also do a plus three for the peripheral epithelium. So if I wanna do this in the US, I would treat on the epithelium, minus 275, minus 0 0.75 by 28 degrees, on the epithelium, and then do a plus three. So the patient will end up being a minus six, but with the topography that you saw before. Very confusing. But there's ways around it, and the name of the game here is to normalize the cornea. The intracornea rings are excellent in short-term normalizing the cornea. They can, in contrast to laser, reshape the whole cornea. So they don't only flatten the central cornea, they reshape the whole cornea. The problem with intracornea rings, and we reported on this, is that the cornea will not harvest plastic material for a long time. A lot of the eyes will erode, will uh, get keratolysis, the rings will protrude. So there's a lot of promise in using allograft tissue rings that is coming up. There's presentations in this meeting. We have uh, published using xenograft, pig eye cornea rings in ex vivo to create a ring type correction. Uh, Susan Jacobs is pioneering work. She calls it CAIRS, C-A-I-R-S a procedure that you use a femto to create the channels and you're putting in rings that are made out of allograft cornea tissue. So that theoretically may be a solution for that. Uh, but in my hands, rings give a great immediate result, much faster than this, but they're terrible long term because my patients rub their eyes a lot, they live in an environment with a lot of sand, a lot of foreign material, and the long-term results are not as good in my hands. But I have colleagues that do routinely rings and cross-thinking, and they're very happy with them.
Right. If you do the trick that we talked about, do your topo guided treatment on the epithelium, it's hard to explain. We have to look at the numbers. Basically, you will convert your myopic topography guided into a hyperopic topography guided. So the laser will do nothing in the center. It will reshape the cornea periphery, so it will steepen the cornea around the cone. So the cone is a single spot on the cornea that's protruding, right? So it will reshape the whole central cone to be the same, to the same keratometry. So that's a normalized cornea now. So, but it's going to be a higher myopic eye. So you can do a fake IOL or a lens exchange to achieve a metropia with far better quality of vision than you did before. So there is ways to work around that. And you don't have room. If it's 390 and you take the epithelium off, you're at 350. If you laser 60 microns from a 350 cornea, you'll end up with a 290 cornea. What are you going to cross-link at 290? There's not enough tissue left. 290 cornea, once you're under 380, it's questionable whether any cross-linking will work, because cross-linking works and needs bulk of cornea to stabilize the cornea. You can't cross-link 200 microns of cornea. So you, that, that's why the cutoff for cross-linking with the FDA trial is 400 microns. Now we've pushed that border a little bit and we've published cases that are 380, 370, but this is out of uh, the norm of the machine. And you have to consent the patients extensively that this may work, this may not work, and they may still need to have the transplant. But I would not make this my practice routine to, to treat corneas that are under 400 microns. I invariably tell my patients if they reach 400, a cornea transplant is on the table. Because they may end up needing it. Even if they're cross-linked. Let's assume you've cross-linked the cornea, it's 400 microns. What part of the cornea is cross-linked? The epithelium is not cross-linked, right? So let's take the 50 microns off. So the top 50 microns of that cornea are cross-linked, the top 50 of the 350. So now you do a laser treatment and you take those 50 microns off. So you took off your shield. Now you're dealing with a cornea that's, again, softer. So you took off your advantage. It may work. Nothing in nature is exactly the same on everybody. It may work. You may be able to uh, get away with it. Uh, it will be very hard to explain this to one practice lawyer in the U.S. that you actually treated a cornea that was 380 microns and now it's 300 microns. I'm sorry? Yeah, I would use higher energy for a shorter exposure because that, in my hands, achieves a, a, a shallower cross-thinking effect. But there's many ways to do that. You can use that bandage lens on that doesn't have UV block and use it as a tissue extender. There's a lot of ways to work that. This used to be an eight-hour course. We used to have a course prior to each meeting, a whole day. So it's very difficult to do this in an hour and a half. I hope we covered some of the material, but if, if we got a little bit of thinking that topography guided normalizes the cornea and it's difficult to have a refractive target, and that even in eyes that see 2020, if they have a high IHD, their quality of vision is terrible. So not everything in life is smell and acuity. Quality of vision is very important for 